Welcome back to Pagan Valley, everyone. Tonight, we are taking a trip back in time to what some historians call the New Age and a group that sprung out of it. Anyone familiar with 60s and 70s New Age movements would be familiar with groups like the People's Church led by Jim Jones, the Manson family, and the hellish nightmare that became Synanon. But when exploring for more examples of groups to come out of this period in human history, I found myself constantly stumbling over the same reference to a group known as the Family. So making a left turn in my research and diving into this strange name led me down a rabbit hole to probably the most detached cult from reality to ever exist. In all honesty, a cult like the family makes Heaven's Gate or the Branch Davidians seem almost understandable. Because at the end of the day, I can still piece together what those groups believed in before they led to their unfortunate fates. The family is incomprehensible, however. It almost seems surreal in its sheer detachment from logic, morality, and fundamentals. But the real tragedy is that the family was a cult with powerful members and had tentacles that spread into the halls of justice, leading to an unclimatic end that has left victims and investigators furious at the legal system in Australia. And it all starts in Melbourne with this man named Raynor Johnson. Born in 1901 in England, Raynor Johnson was a well-educated member of the upper class since birth. He would earn a PhD in physics and start his academic career writing several books on the subject of spectroscopy, the bending of light through prisms. But like most scientists in the early 20th century, Johnson realized that creating rainbows and cubes wasn't as popular as the new science of psychology, and so he pivoted from physics into the new subject of parapsychology, the study of abnormal mental phenomena in cases such as hypnosis, telepathy, and pretty much anything paranormal that could be affecting the human mind. Along with this came extra-religious studies and historical philosophy. Although this may sound like a sudden change in career, it would prove favorable as Johnson would be hired as the Master of Methodist Queen's College in Melbourne, Australia. For a decade, Johnson continued to expand his writings on parapsychology until the early 1960s. In the early years of that decade, Johnson and his wife would visit India and speak to its president at the time, Sarvapali, a very influential Indian statesman and philosopher who would extremely influence Johnson's later work. But more importantly, Johnson met with two extremely crucial Indian mystics at the time, Vinoba and Swami, who introduced Johnson to the ideas of mysticism. Upon his return to Australia, Johnson's next published works had less to do with psychology and Western religious studies and more to do with mysticism, specifically the type of mysticism that attempted to branch the Eastern and Western religions. However, these controversial works forced Johnson to retire from Queen's College in 1964. While as the master, Johnson had purchased a property of land in the Dandenong Ranges outside Melbourne. This land would become his sanctuary for Christian mysticism, and he called it Santinicatan, or the abode of peace. With the followers of Johnson calling themselves Santinicatans. And while Johnson and his wife lived on this property, they would host lectures and classes on mysticism and how it is connected to Christianity. But everything would change for this group when Johnson, in his elderly years, would hire an instructor to lead these group discussions, 
and that someone was Anne Hamilton Byrne. At first I was going to play up this character in the story as a neutral figure before revealing what they would do during the peak of this cult. But after all my research, I'm not. This woman is evil, and probably the worst pathological liar I've ever heard speak, but we'll get to all of that later. Anne Hamilton Byrne was born to a wealthy family in Melbourne. Her early life is mostly a mystery, and for this video her story doesn't begin until the 1960s, when she was a yoga instructor for middle-aged Melbourne mums. According to Vice News, the way Johnson and Byrne got in contact was that Byrne made an appointment to meet him in his office while he was still the master at the college. In this meeting, Byrne convinced Johnson that not only was she aware of the spiritual research he was conducting, but also that Byrne had the ability to see the future through her yoga practice. Once Santinica 10 members began practicing yoga with Byrne, her lessons became more and more focused upon herself. This would lead to the claim made by Byrne that she was the second coming of Jesus Christ, a bizarre claim to us in reality, but deep within the Christian mysticism Johnson had created on his property, many, and I mean many, members believed her and began believing her visions. Of such visions Byrne had while in her meditation and yoga sessions, one was that of the apocalypse a world-ending event where extraterrestrial entities would come to Earth to destroy those that were not the chosen ones of God. This premonition made by Byrne would be the first step for the Santinicatans to take towards the formation of the family. So Raynor Johnson had created what was basically the grassroots for a cult, but it hasn't gotten to anything extreme yet. Just rich middle-aged couples going out into nature to practice their faith and do yoga. But this group that met on Johnson's property would quickly grow in popularity, and soon its roots began to spread into the nearby towns and cities. But at this point in the story, children were not yet involved, and the people who visited Johnson's land were still upper-class adults looking for a New Age alternative to Christianity. The first and largest red flag in my opinion is the New Haven Hospital, which was located in the nearby city of Kew. This was a psychiatric hospital and at the time was owned and managed by a man named Marion Villamec. Villamec was a spiritual man and became a Santinicatan member in the early days of the group. Under his influence, many staff members also converted to Santinicatan, and even more disturbing, these staff members would convert psychiatric patients to the group as well, deeming it a suitable form of treatment. A part of this spiritual procedure, Villamec and the hospital board approved the use of hallucinogenic drugs like LSD on their patients, and according to the later investigation into the family, one of the original members under Raynor Johnson, who suffered from mental illness while on the property, allowed these doctors to treat him outside of the hospital. This experimental treatment included electroconvulsive therapy, several dosages of LSD, and two lobotomies while on Johnson's property. Returning back to Byrne, as the 1960s began to bleed into the 1970s, Byrne had found the solution to her vision of the coming apocalypse and that was in the form of God's chosen children, 
specifically Burns' chosen children who she would raise to be perfect in every way. Building a home on Johnson's property, Byrne and her husband Bill began recruiting members within the group to give up their children to the couple, a decision these parents would later say was in the best interest of their child, for they were chosen to survive the coming end of the world. These children would live in the home of Byrne and made to wear similar clothing and have their hair bleached blonde. Not only was it an aesthetic choice for how she pictured the chosen children of God, but having all of the fake siblings share the same bleached hair would be a piece of evidence for Byrne's case that all of the children were actually related. As Byrne's influence began to take over more of the Santinicatans, Dr. Johnson was reaching his final years and becoming more and more reclusive in his own home on the property. Unfortunately, I am unable to find anything that says whether or not Johnson was aware of the doomsday cult his Christian mystic sanctuary had turned into. But since I'm a betting man, I would guess that Byrne was such a manipulator, she was probably able to keep lying whenever she had to meet with him and Johnson just believed her. But this new formation of the Santinicatins would adopt a new name with their new ideas, and those that were following Byrne, including unwilling children, would refer to the group as the family. And now the nightmare for the children of these members would begin. Byrne had high expectations for her adopted children, she wanted them perfect in every way imaginable. In doing so, there were lots of rules the children had to follow, including laborious chores and rigorous religious studies. Failure to meet these high expectations resulted in very violent beatings that would cross the line into torture. These beatings would be carried out by the adult members of the cult that helped run the family called aunties and several times Byrne herself would partake dishing out punishments beside her verbal abuse. One specific punishment I found was in this interview with one of the child survivors of the cult. When one of God's children was accused of lying, Byrne would take the child and submerge their head in a pail of water to the point of drowning. According to the survivor, Sometimes the child hadn't told a lie but would be held down anyway in order for Byrne to teach them a lesson. A lesson that she would shout so loud that the child struggling to breathe in the cold water would hear. Better to drown than to be a liar. While during this time, the predolescent children were given a concoction of different psychiatric drugs that pretty much numbed them to the whole experience with burn. Drugs like these, for example. But it got much darker than that. Once a child became adolescent, they went through sort of a ritual put on by burn, where they would be given a heavy dose of LSD and locked alone in a blackout room for them to experience the truth. And if any of you have experienced acid or LSD, you would know that this is an instant recipe for a horrible trip. And honestly, based on my own experiences with this drug, this is probably the most messed up thing Byrne did to these kids. And it's no surprise that this abuse of drugs resulted in several children developing severe cases of psychosis and other mental illnesses. When the family had been around for over a decade, Byrne believed that the group of children was supposed to be larger than 9 to 12 kids currently in the family. So under her orders, the cult would attempt probably the most wild crime during its existence. Remember how I said Johnson's followers were the upper middle class of the nearby towns and cities? Well, among those were some insanely wealthy and powerful people that joined his group, including high-ranking medical and political figures from the area. Using them and their connections, 
Byrne devised a plan to kidnap newborn infants from hospitals and use her connections to forge birth certificates, saying they were her kids. But for this con to work on the members of the cult who still had a conscience, Byrne pretended to be pregnant in the time before each kidnapping so no one in the family would question her. And when the hospitals panicked, the Santinicatins and the staff would be able to sweep it all under rugs. As the family entered the 1980s, Byrne was reported to have increased the number of children from 9 to 12 to a total amount of 24 after they began kidnapping newborns. Despite their connections to people in powerful places, the missing children reports became too much for one police officer at the Victoria Police Department. Lex DeMann was the senior investigator for the department and created Operation Forest. The changed birth certificates gave the name of their primary suspect, Anne Hamilton Byrne, but evidence was needed to prove that Byrne was not the mother of the stolen children and those birth certificates were in fact faked. Something that turned out to be rather difficult whenever the police came to the home of Byrne. As retold by one of the survivors of the cult, Anne Byrne had constructed the home to have secret doors for the children to be forced into in order to hide from unwanted guests. If Operation Forest was to be conducted by Lex DeMann, they would need confirmation that the children were present in the home in order to conduct a raid. This would take months of spying on the cult and countless impromptu interviews with members that entered and left Johnson's property. But eventually, Lex and the Victoria Police Force would catch a break, and this event would have the followers of Dr. Johnson left in absolute disarray. After several years of deteriorating health, the 86-year-old Raynor Johnson had passed away in his private estate. His death would leave many questions for investigators and survivors of the cult for years after. How much of Anne Byrne's abuse of power did he actually know about? After all, he was already in his mid-70s by the time Anne had gone full schizo, and nowhere in his writings did Johnson ever write about the need to have perfect children for an upcoming apocalypse. What is known is that his passing revealed a problem within the family. Those older members that followed Johnson were not fond of Anne Byrne, but due to their loyalty to him, carried on with Byrne's activities with the children. But once Johnson had passed, the evidence began flooding in, and it wasn't long before the Victoria Police had all the evidence they needed to make their move against the family and the final piece would come from one of the child survivors themselves. Sarah Hamilton Byrne was expelled by her adoptive mother in 1987 because of arguing and rebellious behavior within the family. With the support of a private investigator and others, she then played an instrumental role in bringing the family to the attention of the Victoria Police. As a result, a raid finally took place at Kai Lama, one of the buildings on the property, on Friday the 14th of August 1987, and all children were removed from the home. The children were in various states of mental health. Some had adjusted to the cruel world and had built around them and had grown up into young adult age. Others were less than eight years old and were traumatized worse than the officers first realized. The fates of the surviving children is the most heartbreaking part of this story. Some survivors were able to make it through therapy and return to a normal life, but some would not be able to make that transition. Several children as the years passed tragically took their own lives the details of which I will omit from this video out of respect, but many survivors did end up finding their biological parents, such as Sarah from before, 
who now has gone on to become a family doctor. So what did the police do with Byrne? After the raid in 1987, Anne Hamilton Byrne and her husband Bill fled Australia for the next six years. With the suspects still at large, Operation Forest continued and expanded into an investigation involving police in Australia, the UK, and the US, which resulted in their final arrest in June 1993 by the FBI in the town of Hurleyville in the Catskills of New York. They were extradited to Australia and charged with conspiracy to defraud and to commit perjury by falsely registering the births of the three unrelated children as their own triplets, charges that were later dropped. Yeah, those connections that Byrne had in Victoria, they ran really deep. It's one of the most bizarre legal cases in Australia's history, and it's been studied religiously by legal scholars. But most importantly, it made the survivors like Sarah and the investigators like Lex feel as if justice had not been dealt. Byrne's final penalty was 2,700 pounds for making a false declaration of birth. She and her husband were not charged at all for kidnapping. In 2009, two of the cult's victims received compensation from Hamilton Byrne but just as some of the other victims attempted to pursue her through the courts, she was diagnosed with dementia, a convenient excuse to not have to stand trial in order to confront the victims of her cruelty. And technically the story does end there, but I found an interview with Anne Byrne three years ago with 60 Minutes Australia in her final months before her passing, and let me tell you, it's unnerving. I'm no psychologist, but I'll try to describe what this woman is like. She's a sociopath through and through. She has lived an entire life telling lies and having to cover for those lies with new ones. Even in this interview, in her final months of life, you can still see the gears turning behind her eyes, struggling to make new lies while being confronted by a survivor and the journalist. I don't want to turn this into a Jim Can't Swim video, but just take a look at this. And do you remember giving her LSD at the age of 14? LSD? No, no, no. That never happened? But you're asking me and then telling me. I'm asking you. Did it happen? I have no memory of that. Somehow the children survived their time in this house of horrors, though in the years since, some have committed suicide and many have suffered psychological and emotional problems. Sarah was able to escape the sect, but has not been able to escape her tortured past. After a failed bid to take her own life, her leg became infected and had to be amputated. Does it hurt you that, that she has tried to take her own life because of the way she was brought up? Of course it does. It's not the way she was brought up, it's the way it handled, the way, the way it went out. We didn't have everything that we needed, we had most things. I bought the bigger house because of the likes of little Sarah. You thought a house would make everything right? Well, I just thought it would give them more room. People don't try and take their life because their house is too small. You're not smart enough. For what? In your heart. What's in your heart is not the same. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. No, of course you don't. They're saying that they were systematically abused and beaten. Why would the children say it if it wasn't true? I don't believe they did. They've said it. You're getting your point over that you're looking for trouble. It doesn't matter that you are. I'm not looking for trouble. We had to, we had I'm not looking down. for trouble, I'm looking for the answers. One day your children will betray you and then you'll know how hard it is to, to not, to, to just be yourself. This is Michael Stevenson, one of Anne Hamilton Byrne's most devoted followers and likely to take over as leader of the cult when she dies. All the children made all of this up, did they? Could be. 
And they were well, paid well, for I'm it. They were that. paid for it. I'm, I'm asking you that. You were paid a lot of money. We weren't paid any money, Michael. You were certainly paid. I'm asking. We paid. So it didn't happen in your eyes either? I, I, so I had a son there. And how did he go? Fine. Was he abused? No, of course not. Was he beaten? No. Was he disciplined? Of course not. There, there, there's a part of natural discipline in families. He was beaten. No, he was never beaten. He never has no, never no, said no, that he no. was beaten. No wonder he fell into a, the wayside when he... He didn't. No, he didn't fall in a heap. You lot did. She's a monster. Anne Byrne clearly has no understanding of right and wrong. Granted, she had been diagnosed with dementia before this interview, but the way she answered some of the questions but was aloof to others makes me think otherwise. It's a bizarre interview considering the damage she had done to so many children. Anne Byrne passed away on June 14th, 2019 in Melbourne, Australia. She passed away without ever facing legal justice for her crimes. Through donations from the rest of Johnson's cult throughout the decades, she had a fortune of $50 million. And with her passing, the family was finally broken. And around Australia, survivors and investigators at least received some closure. For perhaps if Byrne had escaped justice in this world, perhaps she received it in the next. Thank you for watching to the end of the video. If you want to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to see your name at the end of the video, consider supporting Pagan Valley on Patreon like these lovely folk. Also, you can follow me on Twitter for more announcements regarding the channel. Also, I want to give a quick thank you for 25,000 subscribers. To all of you new subs, thank you for your recent support. But to you subscribers who have been here for a long time, thanks for sticking by me. I'm sure all of you can guess I'm basically a one-man production, and since I've graduated college, I'm now working 40 to 50 hours a week at my full-time job while also running this channel. It's been really hard, and I just wanted to say thanks because it means a lot to me. With that, this has been Pagan Valley and I wish you all a good evening.